Hallelujah. Amen. Just want us to put up our hands together as we bring the servant of God, Bishop Dr. David Makimei, to bring the word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for your word, even as I share it with your children. God, I want to depend on the Holy Spirit, even to release the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation. It's our desire that your word shall be the light unto our feet and even unto our movement, wherever we are needed to be. Let it be by the word and the command of your precept. Jehovah, this hour of the afternoon, we release ourselves to you. Even this morning as we con continue even to understand that there are things that accompany salvation. I pray, Father, that your people will not just listen as a series, but they shall find your voice in every single word. I thank you, Father, because of the strengthening of our faith and the way, God, you are developing us even to have a teacher in the Christian walk. I thank you, Father, for the grace of maturity. I thank you, Lord, because of the light thereof in the spoken word. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together as we appreciate the praise and worship team. Thank you so much. Thank you for leading us to a moment of worship and praise. I tell you, people, you must appreciate that you're in the house of God. And the moment you're given a time to dance in the house of the Lord, I keep saying there are two things that are very expensive. When you talk of time and going to the gym, the moment you are given a chance to dance in the church, you better call it your moment of gym. In the spirit and in the physical, you dance, you appreciate the Lord. You are not saying a better amen because you don't understand that. But I want to tell you, when you hear of healing in the house of God, you can also get your breathing smooth the moment you are praising. And dancing before the Lord. Amen. I want us to go to Hebrews chapter number 6. Remember our scriptures that we have been looking at. And today I bring to you another dimension of the topic. We have Hebrews chapter number 6. Look at verse 9 to 12. But I'm specifically concerned about verse 11. The Bible says, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. Somebody say diligence. Say like you mean it. Say diligence. Continue to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Amen. I want to remind you that since January when we tackled the exposition of the theme of the year <clears throat> that is the manifestation of grace, I want you to know there is something we noted there where the Bible says that with the fullness of grace abounding towards us with all sufficiency and we also saw something that we shall be equipped, empowered to do every good work. In the month of February, we are looking at these works 
the works that accompany salvation. They are better things that accompany salvation. Christians, hear me again. You are not called a Christian just to live waiting to appear in heaven one day. You have been given the opportunity as a Christian to show what Christianity is. To do the works of Christianity. To walk the talk of the gospel. To live a life that can be read by others. Showing the works of the kingdom. You remember when Apostle Paul was talking to the church. Writing to Ephesians. When there was uprising of evil and human doctrines. He said that God gave some to be apostles, others to be evangelists or preachers, others to be prophets. We have what we call teachers and the pastors. So that they may equip the saints for the works of service. Our salvation, our being born again is not a word or a name or just a title. It is a calling to a certain operation. You are called upon to work. And when you look at these works that accompany salvation, we need to understand you cannot fulfill, you cannot achieve, if at all you are not going to observe these things. Like we saw last Sunday, we looked at love. As much as you are going to remain in Christianity, People are waiting to see the love of God upon you. Now today, I want to bring to you something very important concerning these words. The rewards of diligence. The rewards of diligence. That is verse 11. And we can repeat that verse. And we see it again. The Bible says, and we desire. Look at the writer of Hebrews. Talking of generally the shepherds the pastors the bishops the ministers the elders that we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end when we look at the rewards of diligence what is diligence in the real sense many people have done a lot of hard work Many people do so many things. But I want to bring the aspect of diligence in the Christian life. And when I talk about this, don't look at yourself only in the church. Look at yourself even in your secular job. Where you are employed. Where you are doing your business. We must grow Monday to Sunday. It's not just one day. Bishop is not teaching you only to empower you when you are seated in the sanctuary. It is to make sure that your life grows. You are also impacting other areas that pertain to you. Look at this. Diligence is good to know we have dictionaries. And one says that diligence is careful and persistent to work. Careful and persistent work. Do you hear the writer of Hebrews saying with the assurance of hope to the end. When you talk of persistent, it's not a technical appearance. It is not a hit and run. You do it and then tomorrow you are normal. Today you are vibrant. You are born again. You are testifying. You are preaching to everybody and then next year we try to look for you, you are nowhere. It's like you are hiding in a cave. There must be persistence. When you talk of the works that accompany salvation, you must know it is to the end. That's why Revelation chapter 2, you'll find verse 10 talking of being faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. That is important to note. And uh, diligence is careful and persistent work. It's also called effort. The effort you put. 
It is also earnestness. That eagerness in whatever you are doing. It is the passionate drive that puts you into work. And even if you go to the secular world, successful people are people of diligence in whatever they are doing. They don't allow anything to come between them and what they are focused to do. It is also called attentiveness. Are you attentive to details in whatever you are doing? Yes. Are you the Sunday school teacher? Are you the praise and worship team leader? Are you the men leader? Are you the ladies leader? Do you become attentive to details? Yes, you are there employed in an office. Are you attentive? These are questions we need to ask ourselves. It is to do with the persistence. For you to be diligent. I'm talking about the rewards of diligence. For you to succeed in diligence, my friends. You must be persistent. People who give up easily have lost their next opportunities. When God has allowed you and given you where to put your hand and do something, before you complain, before you say anything, ask yourself, am I persistent? The other thing about diligence is commitment. You cannot see the fruit of your effort if you are not committed. What are you doing? What has God allowed you to do? My dear ones, that which God has allowed you to do as a Christian, be committed to. I would like to tell you, if you have no commitment, then count God out. Because God is a God of commitment. This morning I was marveled at Genesis chapter 1 when I was... Uh, doing it in the radio, through the radio on creation. And you look at God's persistence, order, plan. That is the God we preach. It's the God that we talk of. Imagine if God decided to rest before the seventh day. Supposing he decided to do day one, day two, and then he rests on day three, only to wake up and fight there is no order. If, and I want to show it to, to you to see that when you have day one to day seven, that is the plan. If you also break your order that you have no plan Monday to Sunday, you will find a problem. You miss some things that are there. That's a cycle that ought to be looked into. Don't worry, I'll come down uh, to where you are. Diligence has also to do with the concentration. Concentration. A diligent Christian in church will concentrate when the sermon is going on, when the worship is going on. A diligent Christian in church is not there in a doubt. The migrant, there are people in church. For only 10 minutes, then 5 minutes outside, then coming. And if you see them in church, it's not here anyway. But if you see them in church, you would think they are managing other affairs outside. Let me tell you, if you are a diligent Christian, you must be a concentrating a Christian. That's about dictionary. I'm not talking of difficult things. That's the dictionary concerning diligence. But you know, when you talk of giving something the due diligence, you talk of giving your best to that thing. When you hear somebody saying due diligence is needed here, it means you give your best. You give your best. I want to say for sure you have not become 
your best. Your best is yet to come. But it's calling upon you as a child of faith to hold on with the diligence whatever God has opened for you. A diligence for sure, it is not a business. It is business. In other words, it's not being busy. You can be busy doing nothing. Did you know that? You can be a busy body. So when you talk of diligence, that is so much in the Bible. You discover that you need to be on business. You are doing something. You are particular. Hello. Praise the Lord. I would wish you to look at this. What about who is this believer who is diligent? Can we look at behaviors or perhaps the qualities of a diligent a Christian? This one we look at the same book but chapter 11. The same book I was reading first I read Hebrews chapter 6 verse 11. Now I want to interchange. Look at chapter number 11 verse 6. Chapter 11 verse 6. What do you see there? My Bible says that this is verse 6. Very clear here from New King James Version. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I've read that verse many times, but this time I saw it so different and so nourishing. When you look at the behaviors of a diligent Christian, one, number one, there is one with an intimate relationship with the God. One who is after intimacy with the God. That is the person the Bible says that he will please God. Because why? Because you get to God through these two things. Your faith and diligence. That's how you connect. Let's talk of a prayer person. If you are praying and you are not diligent in your prayer. You are a technical appearer in the presence of God. You will never have that intimacy with the God. If you will never think about God throughout the day. If whatever you do and whatever you are acquiring, you don't count God there. You are not involving God. You don't have a relationship with God. You'll never see the real diligence even in your own work. And I want to say from today, determine that before I put my effort in my work, in other assignment, I want also to increase effort in having a relationship with the God. That's where you begin. Is somebody listening to me? You begin from there. And this is where you find a diligent Christian has that desire. And these are the people who please God because they have faith and they are seeking him diligently. When you look at some people, I think it's somebody David something. I remember the name. But I know he starts with David, like me. Who kept saying that when I look at my life, I see a lot is expected from me. And I can only also expect from God. If people are expecting from me, then I need to be expectant before God. Another one said 
that I find my day is going to be so busy with a lot of work to do. And that's why I begin the day with three hours of prayer. That one challenges me. I confess that I would wish to love prayer like such a person. He has a lot to do, but he begins. And he gives explanation. Is because if I'm given six big trees to cut and I'm given a, given a day, I will not go rushing to cut the trees. I will start by sharpening my tool, my axe. You spend an hour sharpening your axe so that when you go to cut the trees, it will be very easy. But if you rush, you didn't sharpen, you are going with a blunt axe, you will not succeed. So prayer, seeking the Lord diligently, is the moment of sharpening your tools. Can I hear an amen? So that diligence of seeking the Lord is qualified for all Christians. I keep asking, what was the difference between Martha and Mary? Sisters, enjoying the same fellowship with the Christ. But one day, the difference was very clear. When Jesus visited Bethany, that is in Luke uh, chapter 10. When he visited Bethany, Jesus appears. You see, Martha is welcoming. Actually, it's like Martha was the elder one. But something unique happened. Martha is busy doing a lot of work. I look at the menu. It was like there were degush, And he also prepared chapatis. And he was very busy. But when Jesus is there, Martha is asking Jesus, don't you care that I'm doing all this work alone and my sister Mary is not helping me. What is she doing? Mary is just sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Now look at this. It's very clear for you to understand that Martha is genuine, very genuine. We have this complaint. Girls are complaining in the house when boys are only coming and eating what they have prepared. Even some wives complain that nobody else is assisting, is working. But I want to ask you, why is Jesus now going to respond like this? Because Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you have bothered yourself with too much. You have bothered yourself. It is only one thing that is needed. One thing that is required. Can I put your theology straight? Jesus never said that people should not work. Jesus was not implying that everybody is seated down. No, he never implied that. Why? Because he was a beneficiary of what was prepared by Martha. He also ate. Jesus meant for your life to flow, for you to relieve yourself of stress, for you not to get weary. This is the first thing, the one thing that is required. And it's like you missed it yourself. Martha, you did not begin from there. And Mary has chosen that part of work. That part of work. And this is the diligence I want you to look at. A diligent Christian begins from the right position. You don't begin from upward. You begin from the root where you are needed. Diligently seeking the Lord and having time. And that's why you'll fight the difference between the two. I like saying if you count on their wealth, Mary was richer than Martha. Mary could afford a perfume 
of more than 120,000 Kenya shillings. And not just a perfume. He, she could afford to break and anoint the dusty feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were dusty because he walked on open shoes. I've said that again. But look at this. Diligence. A diligent Christian begins from that. One with a desire for the intimate relationship with the God. Help me to ask your neighbor. How do you relate with your creator? Ask your neighbor that. How do you relate with your creator? Okay, okay. Ask him or her this way. Do you know your God? Is, do, do you know him? Because we need to, to start asking ourselves. We need to do what we call stock taking. How do you relate with him? Are we going to find on the last day Jesus telling some of us, go, I never knew you. Yes, you mentioned me, but on the lips, your heart, we are far away uh, from me. Number two, number two, behaviors of a diligent Christian. What, number two is self-motivation. Self-motivation. I want to tell you, if you are a diligent Christian, a diligent worker, there should be self-motivation. They said in the corporate world, we have intrinsic and extrinsic. Those who are in that field, you know. When you talk of intrinsic motivation, it is coming from within. It is not coming from outside. It is not when people tell you, okay, cheer up. It is within yourself. Even when there is no token, the token of telling you, hey, hurry up, do it. Even when there is nothing pledged for you, you can still work. I, sometimes I tend to ask myself, supposing eternity, eternal life, heaven and the crowns, are with the drone. Would we still continue loving this God? Would we still continue preaching, you know, praising? If one time it is announced and we see it on the sky, no more rewards in heaven. Shall we change the direction? Have you found it good to be busy in the kingdom? Have you found it good to be a worshiper of the living God? That you can continue. Are you ready to stand in the market and tell people, even if all of you deny that there is heaven, even if there isn't, I will still continue in this life because I have seen the benefit. I am motivated. It is from within. This is where you've, you, you fight the Christians who are not found in the groups of complaints. You will not hear anyone saying, you see, even they don't notice me and the way I'm doing a lot of work, they don't even acknowledge that I'm in this church, I give a lot. Let me tell you, when you are self-motivated, you don't mind whether it is said about you or against you. You are moving on. It is like your duty. It is your responsibility. You can decide to stand there and say like David, let nobody panic. I'm going to handle this. Yes, I'm ready. You are motivated from within. And let me tell you, there are rewards of diligence. If you live like that, you are self-motivated. You are like Apostle Paul saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I have the confidence. I know him that I have believed. I know from within. He tells them in, Eph in, in Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, when they are telling him, you know what? You are going to be jailed if you go to Jerusalem. And that's a prophet saying, Agabush. He tells him the owner of this belt shall be chained when he goes to Jerusalem and Paul stands and tells them anyway excuse me not only being arrested 
I'm ready even to die for the sake of the gospel. Because I've become a servant, a slave of this gospel by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Be self-motivated in whatever God has allowed you to do. I've seen a motivated doctor is always a successful doctor. One who is inspired, one who is empowered, will do the work diligently. I've seen the difference between an inspired teacher and one who is not inspired. An inspired teacher will leave the student feeling, wow, this is the subject. An inspired and that motivated Christian will leave everybody in the estate knowing salvation is good. It is not boredom. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Be self-motivated even in your Christianity. Don't be like this family that stayed in Buruburu many years ago. And when they visited their home, home place, the up country, the child in that family had never gone to the villages. It was the first time. And they say it's a story. When they went and got out of the car, the first thing they saw is a cow. And the boy asked the father and the mother, so even this cow is born again. And then I was, what does that mean? The question was, why? And the boy said, because I see this fish is like that one of my dad when the so-called born again people visit him. And it was like, how? But only to be discovered that that man was ever gloomy. And especially when you want to talk about Christ, it must be that one. You know this, humble yourself as you enter the house of God. There is no joy, nothing. Tell your neighbor, rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, tell them in a better way. Don't bring us the cowfish. It's, it's good to tell one another. Don't bring us the cowfish. Can somebody clap to Jesus? Can you appreciate the Lord? Let's appreciate the Lord. Number three, a qualities, oh my, qualities of a diligent Christian. Number three is the eagerness to learn or to improve on skills. Ready to learn new things. That is very important. Being enthusiastic to learn new things. As a Christian, I want to tell you, it's important to desire to walk with the spirit that we call teachability. Teachability. Hello? Is somebody writing down? Important. Please be eager to learn. I've seen Christians who don't grow. They don't improve. Because it's like they have closed totally their brains. They don't want to increase any knowledge. It's enough to come and go. But there are others who want to learn. There could be a young one here who is seeing this is Bishop preaching. Some years to come I'll be taking over. That's a desire to learn. And that person will go and dig information, get to learn, get to study, pray. Are you, are you touched when you see that there is room for you and you can do more, you can do better? A diligent Christian will be eager to learn new things. Eager to study. That's why the Bible will be talking about reading this book. Read and read again. You can read. These are not the days to fear reading the whole Bible. You can read it. Even if you start reading it like a novel and you read and finish, 
Then you revise again. Get to know. You are not diligent if you are not empowering yourself. It's normally called capacity building. Even as a Christian, you must build your capacity. Get information. Proverbs 23, 23 has always said that by knowledge and said it not. It may not be there. Oh, I didn't know they came. Eh? You came back. Oh, thank you. So let me rush now to closing because of time. Please desire to know. Knowledge is power. Even as a Christian. If you are doing the sales, you are in business, get information about that. Go deeper. I don't know. You'll find you don't achieve. If you are diligent, a diligent Christian must manage time. Let's stand on our feet. I may touch number five and the benefits in the next service. If you, if you understand Kikuyu, please don't, don't leave us. You can be with us in the next service if there will be space for you so that I continue that one. Amen. How do you find yourself as a Christian? How do you find yourself as a Christian? Where do you get time to sit idle? We shall give an account as far as the resources given to us are concerned. And the resources are things you must watch that the enemy will not take. Which are these resources? You only need to know. The reason why I have said you must be watchful. It is because all the letters of the major resources that God has given you, they form the word thief. Thief. You must watch. Starting from T for time. Time. I for infrastructure that we have. H for human people. People. I've started with the T. H. I for infrastructure. E for any equipment, including what we have. And F. Finances. Those are the resources God has given you. And you have them at home. T for time. H for human, even your children. And the people under your responsibility. I for infrastructure. Even that road you use, Christians. Days are gone when we went throwing every litter on the road. As Christians, we must be organized. We must repent. Simply because the county council will come cleaning. Please stop. Have somewhere in your car put even that bottle of water. When you get to a better place, you put there. Taking care. E for equipment. Utensils in the house. Take care. They costed money. You are in that house. God will ask you how responsible you are. F. Fat finances. So when I say it's the thief to watch, you must keep your eyes open against any destruction. Tell your neighbor diligence. Let's lift up our hands. Tell the Lord to help you. We are Christians. We must not remain in darkness. We must remain in the light of God. We desire, Father, we desire to be diligent. I want you to say a prayer in one minute. Whether you whisper, whether you will talk loudly, I want you to ask God to give you grace to help you to be faithful that you not be a waster of these resources. 
you will not miss where God wants you to be. You will not miss as far as motivation is concerned. Be motivated to do the work that God has called you to do. Be motivated to take care of your family. May God give us this grace. May God release the power, the anointing. Lord, this is our prayer. We surrender to you. We subject ourselves to you. Lord, teach us. Teach us to be accountable, responsible, answerable. Help us, dear Father, in the name that is above every other name. Help us to know where to begin like Mary did. That we may seek you diligently. Father, we know it shall be well with us. Somebody stretch your hands forward. I want to speak a blessing. Not up. Stretch them forward. Do like this. See what I'm doing. I was taught by the Jews when they are praying to their Jehovah. They believe he is going to drop something in their hearts. They stretch them forward. I want to declare something upon your hands, upon your work, upon your business, upon your marriage, upon your family. I want to declare diligence in the name of Jesus. You are not going to lose again the opportunities that God has opened for you. You are not going to be messed up by your own maybe carelessness or laziness. May God help us in the name of Jesus. Father, I invite your spirit upon our brains, upon our minds, upon our hands in the name of Jesus. And I declare Jehovah, there shall be great improvement. There shall be a great empowerment even in these hands, dear Lord. Whatever you give them to put their hands on I shall excel in the name of Jesus. Let them be like the tree in uh, Psalms chapter number one. That Lord God Almighty tree planted by the water side. That whatever they do, they shall prosper. Whatever they touch shall prosper. In the mighty name of Jesus. I declare right now that diligence shall be our portion. We shall be diligent in matters of God. Matters of the kingdom. And matters of the life you've given us. In the name of Jesus. Father we honor you. We bless you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Thank you Father. May your name be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.